In January, my wife and I expect a baby. And therefore, at the moment, I'm particularly interested in anything that is related to the health and happiness of the unborn and the mother. In my work life, I'm interested in the interactions between plants and bacteria. And these interests met when I learned that breastfed babies cannot digest all the nutrients provided by the mother. In fact, some of the sugar is consumed by specific bacteria that help the baby to develop the immune system. And that means that young mothers produce nutrients not only for the baby, but also for organisms that belong to another kingdom, bacteria. So why would they do that? I mean, we all know that bacteria are bad, don't we? I mean, we all know these advertisements of household cleaning agents. Our agent kills 99% of all the germs. And here, the bad reputation of bacteria is exploited. And quite often, the bad reputation of bacteria is justified. Many diseases in the world are caused by bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And therefore, we are heavily trained to perceive bacteria as enemies. And so this marketing and also the bad news about bacteria, um, or because of them, we often don't realize that bacteria are crucial parts of our environment and that they are very important for the health and well-being of humans, animals, plants, and even whole ecosystems. So wouldn't it be smart to ask bacteria for help for our environmental challenges? Or in other words, Shouldn't we see bacteria as our friends and not as our enemies? So today I'd like to take you to a journey into a microscopic world where the bacteria constantly help the plants to grow and reproduce even in a stressful environment. I guess you all remember the weather conditions um, this last summer. It was overly hot and in many regions of the world it was particularly dry. It was so dry that large proportions of the Brazilian forest burned, and in Europe we had a shortage of potatoes, no more french fries or chips. So, the, the heat and the drought, this is clearly one of the most pressing problems in our world. And there is one very important question, how can we help the plants to tolerate the drought? Colleagues of mine, were also interested in this question, and they searched for bacteria that can help plants to tolerate droughts. So they traveled to parts of the world that are particularly dry, like Egypt, Israel, and some parts of the US. And here they collected bacteria that share a long evolutionary history with plants in dry habitats. And they took the bacteria, brought them to the lab, where they also had wheat plants like that one, and these wheat plants or these wheat plants have been exposed to drought. And this is like um, like a or how a plant looks like when you don't water them enough. But then they applied bacteria, those bacteria that they collected before, and this is what happened. So these plants experienced the same drought conditions as the other ones, but here the bacteria turned them into stronger plants. And this came along with some important modification of the plants. For example, the roots changed in a way that specific bacteria could colonize the roots, and they built a sponge-like material around the roots that helped the plants to take up the water from the surrounding soil. And I think this is a wonderful example how bacteria can help plants to grow in even stressful environments. Me and my team, we are interested in very similar aspects of plant-bacteria interactions. For example, in a research project funded by the European Commission, we are looking at alpine plants that interact with bacteria. And one very important function of alpine plants is to protect slopes against erosion. Without plants, and you can see it here, erosion would wipe off the soil from, from slopes with disastrous consequences for both the environment, but also for human infrastructure. 
And our field experiments showed us that plants with large leaves and very large and dense roots are particularly well suited to protect the slopes against erosion. So our question was, can we find bacteria that help the plants to develop these traits? And yes, in a set of lab experiments, we found bacteria that did exactly that. They helped the plants to get large leaves with large and dense roots. The next step will be that we take these bacteria and apply them onto alpine plants, and then we are planning to monitor the erosion on experimental plots. And this will be a crucial step from lab-based finding into real-world applications, and we hope that we can find nature-based solution to solve this problem, which is erosion. So far, I was talking about plants, uh, bacteria that help plants to protect um, slopes against erosion or to tolerate um, drought. But are these the only factors we are interested in? Well, definitely not. We are thinking about many more aspects where bacteria can help plants to grow and reproduce. So let's think for a moment about plant diseases. For example, fire blight. Fire blight is caused by a pathogenic bacterium that infects flowers, mostly of fruit trees, apples and pears. And these fruits fall off the tree within days or weeks after infection. And under good or optimal conditions for the pathogen, whole fruit plantations can be infected with, of course, dramatic losses in fruit yield. And it is natural that farmers need to find ways in order to protect their trees against um, the pathogen, and often they spray antibiotics. But in doing so, they not only kill the pathogen, they often also kill potentially beneficial bacteria. And there are some bacteria that are the natural enemies of the disease. And these bacteria have to be brought to the flowers. And the most efficient way of transporting bacteria to flowers may be pollinators. They are visiting thousands of flowers a day in search for nectar. And indeed, researchers found a way to force bees to pick up bacteria, these beneficial bacteria, and deposit them on flowers. So we can hire bees as nurses that bring the cure in form of bacteria to the flowers, giving the plants the chance to develop fruits, although they are infected with a pathogen. And I think this is a very fascinating, but also quite a specific example for the interactions between flowers, pollinators, and bacteria. I was always curious about the general effects of bacteria on plant pollination. And it all began with a finding that um, flowers host very specific bacteria. And these are bacteria that we can't find on any other plant part. And so our idea was that there must be a reason for this pattern. And we had two hypotheses. The first one was the flowers can control which bacteria can grow on their surfaces. And second, these specific bacteria should have any um, importance for the plant in pollination. Our first experiment showed that some bacteria can use sand compounds as a carbon source. And this means they feed on what we smell from a flower. The pleasant odor of a flower serves as food for bacteria. But interestingly, the same compounds often inhibit the growth of other bacteria. And that means that floral scent did not only evolve to attract pollinators, but also to mediate interactions with bacteria. So now we were motivated by this finding and we needed to know whether bacteria also change the scent emission of flowers. And what, what we had to do to test this question or to answer the question, we had to cultivate plants in a sterile environment. And I know this looks like a tiny and little and, and, and sad plants living in a sterile container, but we had to do that because otherwise we didn't have the chance to smell something that nobody ever smelled before. We smelled the scent of a sterile flower. And this is something that usually doesn't exist. There are no sterile flowers. 
And we compared the scent of sterile flowers with natural flowers that contain, of course, bacteria. And we found that the bacteria remove some compounds, but add others. So, and now, that was, was a great finding for us, and now we were even more motivated. And we needed to know whether this also affects pollination and ultimately plant reproduction. So we went on and planted a number of rapeseed plants, and some of them were treated by us with bacteria. And these bacteria were some, some bacteria that we knew that they have the potential to change the sand emission. And then something happened that was our greatest finding in this context. We found that flowers treated with our bacteria received more visits by pollinators, and this led to more seeds per flower. And now we hope that we can use these bacteria to increase the, the yield in agricultural systems or to help ecosystems to be more productive. Maybe now it's time to emphasize that I'm not talking about genetically modified bacteria, and I'm not talking about bacteria that have been specifically selected over long years until they had the desired functions. I'm talking about bacteria that you can find everywhere in the environment. You can find them in your backyard, on meadows here outside, and even in your office plants. And therefore, when I see beautiful landscapes like that, I do not only see wonderful hiking opportunities, I also see an endless resource of bacteria that we just need to, help, uh, to ask for help for various purposes. So, I was talking about three examples where bacteria help plants to resist drought, to protect slopes against erosion, or to help the plants to be pollinated and, and to reproduce. And these are three results, or yeah, three, three um, findings that are also very important for human well-being. And I think that is fascinating, that we are surrounded by invisible friends that we just need to ask for help for our um, problems. I know that now sounds all easy-peasy. Just go anywhere to the environment, pick a bacterium, put them on flowers, and, now you, and then you will have a strong and healthy and reproductive plants. I have to admit, it is not that easy. There is a long way from our lab findings or our controlled um, field experiments to real-world applications. But I think we are on a good way, and I hope that in the future we find bacteria that help us to reduce the amount of water and of pesticides and of antibiotics that we put on our fields and therefore allow the plants to grow in a more natural way with all the side effects. So I hope the next time you're in, the, in a landscape like that, you not only see the things that you can see with your eyes, I hope you can also see the hidden world, the world of bacteria that are constantly helping the plants and that are an important part of our ecosystems and that provide important and eco-friendly solutions for our problems. And I also hope that you agree with me that most of these bacteria are by far not our enemies, but our allies. Thank you very much.